Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Power Women Summit. I'm Sharon Waxman, the founder and CEO of The Wrap and Wrap Women. Over the past few months, we've been working with STARS, our partner, to conduct our second annual Telling Our Stories film competition. Tonight, I'll be speaking with our six talented finalists, so let's get started. To do that, I'm excited to introduce the STARS Senior Vice President of Original Programming, Karen Bailey. Karen, over to you. Thank you, Sharon, and it is an honor to be here tonight and to be a part of this program. Uh, the Telling Your Stories film competition, which is presented by STARS, is for short films, narrative or documentary, and it's by women and gender non-conforming filmmakers of color. And the films will highlight themes relevant to womanhood, community, and representation. Now, between October 7th and October 29th, we received over 1,100 submissions. So thank you to everyone who participated. And these films were evaluated by industry professionals and they were all competing for one of six finalist spots. And these six films will receive distribution on STARS and the winner will also receive $10,000. In case you haven't already had a chance to watch the films, they are available or viewing on the Power Women's Summit website in the marketplace. And finally, a big thank you to everyone who submitted a film and to our amazing jury and to our programming partner, Women in Films. Thank you, Karen. And now before we bring out the filmmakers themselves, let's take a quick look at the six finalist films. <laughs> Mama, 但總是會懷疑自己是不是做錯的決定。孩子在美國長大會變成什麼樣的人? Find love without having sex? I don't know. But who needs love? Well, I, I want to fall in love. And if we were together, we'd stay virgins forever. What do you mean? 
Well, if you're a lesbian, you don't let guys inside of you. So you never have to lose anything. I said to Lola, don't you see? If we're together, and we stay virgins forever. I kissed Lola. You'll never see me cry. You'll never know I'm in pieces. A quiet storm burn brains in the night for no reason. A mother was shot and killed in front of her child after police violently entered a mid-city gas station. Someone's threatening to leak a video of me. What video? From my hotel room. What hotel? Austin. How is that even possible? Or legal? I'm gonna call you over nope. here. Nope, I have it under control. Do you, Marilyn? Because if you don't, this will be catastrophic. They cannot know about us. We've received numerous complaints from guests here at the hotel about being harassed by one of our employees. What? Someone's been selling Pop-Tarts. Pop Why would anyone do that? Now let's welcome our panelists. Welcome, Gabriela Garcia Medina, who made Little Con Lily, Jasmine Johnson, the filmmaker for Sounds of War, Catherine Chow, A Cure for All Things, Shanrika Evans with Clarissa, Latoya Morgan with Team Marilyn, and Yoko Okamura with Lexical Gap. Welcome, you guys. Hello, hello. Hi. Hello, hello. Welcome, and I am so excited to talk to all of you. Um, let me just say that these films, I'm gonna, I took some notes because they really go across the gamut and really deep. They hit politics, they hit sex, they hit family, they're about personal journeys, and they, some of them use music, you use fantasy, um, uh, special effects, comedy, and you tell these stories in these incredibly brief, Time frames because you only had seven minutes. That was the framework of this competition. I'm a big fan, of, a huge fan of shorts. We have been supportive of shorts for years and years. And this has given us the opportunity to elevate these really different voices that each of you have. So I'm eager to hear from each of you. Uh, let's go around and talk about the origin of your film. Jasmine, let me start with you. Your film, Sounds of War, it mixes fantasy, this black and white fantasy. Um, uh, of uh, a, a woman and her beau, uh, and then it mixed in with this real anxiety about what it is to be uh, in real life as a black person in America today. Talk a little bit about the origin of the story and how it came to you. Yeah, thank you so much for that great introduction and summary. Um, I like to say I'm already famous in my dreams, so I like to sleep. Um, and that's where I pretty much play out my Hollywood fantasy. And so it was getting to a point where even my dreams were getting interrupted by, you know, things that were happening happening in real life in America. And so I feel like I'm at peace in my dreams. And like I said, that's where I live out my, my actual you know, filmmaker fantasies. And so when that kind of got disrupted by the activities that were happening in America, it kind of really did something to me. And so I really just wanted to, you know, flesh that out into a film. It's really beautifully done. Did you make this during COVID or during, uh, you know, after George uh, Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement erupted? 
Um, but yeah, it was definitely after the George Floyd incident and after the Toya incident that actually happened in Tallahassee where I live at. Um, so it really just kind of hit home and I was doing my internship. I was taking online classes and then I decided to make this. So we actually filmed it in July. That's just incredible that you were able to do that. And I want to hear more about that. Shanrika, you're also working with political, um, the politics or cultural politics of the moment in Clarissa. It's such an intimate film. Um, I'll just give a little bit about it. There's a, there's a, a lead character who is going, it seems to be in New York, I'm guessing. Uh, is that right? Um, it was shot in LA, but it was supposed oh, to be. Oh, shot in LA. It's, I see a subway and I think New York, but she's, uh, she, she's almost accosted by a man. You can see that she's you know, reacting to that, triggered by that in some way. And then she comes across a homeless woman who's also talking about her own trauma. It's incredibly powerful. Where did this story come from? And I know this is a topic that is, you know, very important to you in, in, in all of your work. Yeah, so um, this story came from just a personal experience I have talking to a homeless woman when I first moved to LA and actually like seeing her as a whole human and not just, you know, her circumstances. And as we talked, I realized we had more in common than I was even comfortable with admitting. So this wow. film was kind of to show that, you know, we're all connected as women and as humans through this thing that we call life and all of our experiences. I mean, so much of the film, and I really encourage everyone to go watch all the films. They're so good. Um, it's unspoken. What is going on between them and the actress is um, really does a good job of living in that tension. Um, did you shot this? I'm going to ask all of you guys this because I'm just amazed that, that anybody can be making films right now. But did you shoot this during COVID as well, or does this precede that? Uh, this is right before COVID started, like a month or so before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you didn't have to deal with that. And how did you find this? Uh, I mean, the actress is, does it really, I think, well, the lead actress, the one who's uh, confronted, let's say, with a homeless woman who, as you say, has she has more in common with than she'd like to admit. Um, how did you find her? How did that um, come about? Yeah, so that was interesting. I did a casting call and I just saw her face. And I was just like in love with her face and her skin and how she like could emote even via one picture, like her one headshot. It was just like her eyes were so beautiful to me. So I just kind of sent her an email and I said, hey, do you want to be in my movie? And she read the script and agreed to do it. And that's, that's how she came aboard. That's really amazing. It, talk about, is this, this topic is something that you have dealt with before talking about the marginalized, the underrepresented. Why is that important to you? And that might even seem like an obvious question, but I think it's important to kind of, to say it if you can. Yeah, it's incredibly important to me because not only am I a part of the marginalized and the underrepresented, people that I love are a part of it. And I think everyone deserves a voice and everyone deserves to be seen in their full human, whether that's pain or joy or or happiness or whatever it is. I think everyone deserves that chance, like sight. Um, so that is why it's, it's incredibly important for me to, to document those that rarely get seen. It's so true. I mean, I, I feel like uh, that, that's the privilege of, of hearing from all of you is hearing stories that just rarely get, get told. Um, Latoya, your film is called Team Marilyn and it's, and it's very different from actually from all of the mix of the films, because it, it feels to me like it's a short film. It's about a politician, a female politician who has to deal with a sexual scandal uh, on the brink of her uh, big moment. It's really good. It feels like maybe you're working on a feature film of this. <laughs> yes, I yes. always, uh, yes, totally. I always imagined uh, using the short as a jumping off point to expand it into a feature. Um, I love political films. You know, I was really inspired by movies like Ides of March, um, The Candidate, those really gritty uh, political films, but we never see those movies from the black woman's perspective. We never see black characters centered in those films. So that was what I really wanted to do. Uh, tell us, for those who haven't seen the film yet, give us just a quick 
um, sort of, you know, summary of the of the, of the film that goes beyond what I, what I say because it it is it's a black female politician. It's not really the person usually subject of a sex scandal. Right, right. Uh, and you, your logline really, you know, sums it up. It, it's about this woman who uh, has this secret sort of come out on the eve of a really important election. And uh, what I was interested in, in in exploring is the idea of what's happening in politics now, which is sometimes uh, people's private lives are weaponized against them. And if you had this wonderful, really creative politician who's on the cusp of doing great things and someone tries to you know, sandbag them with information from their private lives, how that could really um, take their career in a different direction. It's also, it's super timely because obviously we, we, we have another wave of women coming into politics. Our first female, black, Asian vice president, by the way, we did a whole super cut of people in Hollywood saying like, dear Kamala, that we, that this, going to be um, on the stage tomorrow. So we're all, everybody's so excited about that. But you really took like, you just hit this character in this really vulnerable place. Like you did not lionize her. You didn't make her a hero. Um, it could be a TV series too. I'm just going to tell you right now. <laughs> I'll take that too. I'll take either a film or, or a TV series. Um, but uh, like Kamala Harris is incredible. I'm so excited. She's going to be our, our VP. Um, I think, you know, women in power, just so interesting, you know, by themselves, you know, and to explore that story and go deeper, um, especially in our political climate now, I think black women are the backbone of democracy and it's really time to like center those stories and have them shine and using Marilyn as a catalyst for that was really exciting to me. That's great. Well, I can't wait to see how, how that develops. Um, it's and then we'll. I want to come back to you later and ask about the production because it's very high production values as well. Um, Catherine, your film is a cure for all things. It's very uh, different in the. It's it's got fantasy. It's got special effects. You have a, a young woman who is from an an. I'm gonna. Is it a, a Chinese family to, to who is moving into this or, or moving out of an apartment and discovers this old potion and drinks it and. And things happened. Tell us, tell us, tell us about the origin of that film, and tell us more about the story, the story behind it. Yeah, so it, it's about a Taiwanese, Taiwanese American woman, which you know, there's like there's like cultural overlap there. Um, but she basically finds a, a vial that her mother has left in the fridge that can turn her into their ancestors and their descendants. And over the course of the story, you sort of realize that it was the mother. You're seeing this daughter story through the lens of the mother, who is the one that actually took the potion. Um, I just feel like, you know, over the course of the experiences in my life, I feel like being part of a diaspora, it almost feels like you live in science fiction where you're always sort of straddling two different timelines or two different places or multiple places at once. And I just thought it would be really cool to visualize that in a way that only cinema can really do using special effects. Um, and create a world where that was made tangible. It's it's really delightful. The film is delightful. Was it hard uh, to make it on a, I'm going to guess, a no, I don't know what kind of budget you had, but you're doing special effects and all kinds of uh, funny cuts as the, the character turns into other characters. And yeah, it was a real... Oh, sorry. You go. Um, yeah, it was a real labor of love because a lot of the crew put in time, um, you know, as volunteers on this passion project and we had a very, very low budget. Um, and so we, I really wanted to do things as practically as possible. Um, you know, watch, growing up watching films by someone like Michelle Gondry, who really pulls off the practical effects, it made me feel like despite the low budget and despite the lack of resources, that it was something that I could do. Um, and so we tried to gear everything as much as possible so that when it came time to do the effects at, in post, it was, a lot of it was covered in on set. Mm -hmm. And who are these actors who are, they're really fun to watch. Um, the, the ancestor, the grandmother uh, is kind of hilarious. 
Um, that's actually my mom. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, Taiwanese grandmas just have this like real homey feel. And I, I auditioned a few actresses that they all felt a little too almost elegant and put together and they weren't like comforting. And I just thought, well, and also I needed someone to speak Taiwanese, which is sort of a dialect that pe a language that people don't really speak in younger generations. And certainly it's harder to find in America because you have a smaller pool. And so I finally was just like, I'm going to put my mom in it because she, we aged her a little with makeup and she has that feeling of home. So. <laughs> oh my God. Well, you can tell her that for me that I thought she did a really great job. And um, I think I love that attention to detail that you wanted to make sure that you have the Taiwanese dialect since, well, at least those of us in the United States, most of us wouldn't really make the difference between if it were another Chinese dialect, but that's, it's, re it's really fun. Yoko, let me turn to you. Your film, Lexical Gap, uh, is you. <laughs> um, I guess so. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, so let me just uh, make clear for everybody. You're a musician. You're a punk rocker, you're a filmmaker, I guess you're a poet too? Uh, I am not a musician actually. Um, oh, no. I, I wrote the lyrics of the songs, um, okay. but my a very good friend, Iwe Sharice Wu, who's in a band called Polar Tropica, she helped me write the punk music. It's something that I've always wanted to do is make a punk rock musical, but I myself am, am, am not talented okay, in that well, arena. Credit too. Okay, credit where it's due, but it's like, yeah, what's so fun about Lex Gap is that, it, which is um, about virginity and the lack thereof, it, I, I, love, I love the energy of it. So talk about where it came from and what animates you and what's your, your vision as a filmmaker. Yeah, um, you know, I think as filmmakers, we all we all look to our own, like, original emotional pains, right? Like, that's what we can speak authentically to. And for me, I struggled a lot with, you know, my femininity and um, just sexuality and owning my identity. And, uh, you know, for the longest time, I I just felt so insecure and like, you know, compared to other women, like I wasn't good enough. And all that came from, you know, as I grew older, I could look at the larger world that I was growing up in and see that we live in such a, you know, like sex negative world and we as women aren't encouraged to encourage you know like embrace our sexuality and just start to try to deconstruct that as much as possible in my own life and um what is i'm not even familiar with that term but because that's because i'm really old so what, what what is what is sex negative what is it what is what do you mean by that yeah it just means you know sex education even from when we were younger it's purely from like a clinical place so we're not really taught about pleasure you know, that like, and um, relationships between, you know, especially in the heteronormative relationships of women and men, um, you know, male sexuality is often portrayed in cinema as, as normal and, you know, male orgasm is something that we just kind of see all the time. And uh, with women, it's just, again, I think it's changing now more recently seeing, you know, again, things as simple as like female masturbation for pleasure instead of like just comedy, right? Like, all these things are changing now, but I think as growing up in the nineties, um, it really was like, you just sort of didn't get to see that represented. So for me, I latched onto this idea of, you know, the purity myth, um, that virginity is a concept that was created, uh, essentially in order to, again, control women and like have this, like to build a paradigm between pure is good. And then once you're not pure anymore because you've had sex, like you're bad now, right? It's the Madonna whore complex. Um, and I was fascinated by this concept that, you know, that kind of, again, dynamic of sexuality and like misogyny is in our language. Like it's in the English language and how we use words and that there's actually something called a lexical gap, right? That's the title of my movie, um, which just means that there's a missing word. There's a, a gap in our lexicon when it comes to certain terms and virginity. There's a term for virginity, right? A, a person who has not had sexual intercourse and it's associated with purity, um, you know, and virginity is seen as something with like the Virgin Mary. It's like very religious as well. Um, but there's really no actual word for somebody who has had sex that is that doesn't have a negative connotation like slut or whore. Like I would literally tell people the concept in my movie and be like, there's no word for, so there's no non-stigmatized word for somebody who has had sex, somebody who is post-virgin. Um, and people would jokingly say like, oh, it's slut. Oh, it's whore. And I'm like, you're proving my point. This is like, there's, 
there's a concept missing here of like embracing sexuality as a positive yeah, thing instead yeah, of that. Yeah, like, right. Um, well, there's a whole lot more in the film than just that explanation because it's just, it, it's got this punk music. It, it just has such a great vibe. I loved how you approach this topic. And speaking as the um, clinically old person here, I, I love <laughs> that you can express those things. And having seen that over over decades, that I I agree with the themes that of how uh, sex gets twisted and made toxic instead of celebrated for women, especially. So thank you for that. Finally, Gabriella, definitely not least, although you're last, um, Little Connolly is just a delight. Um, it's about this little girl who is a latchkey kid at home because mom's working and she helps herself to all the things that you are absolutely not allowed to do, eat or do when your parents are home, which is like eating pop tarts and all kinds of junk food. She's delightful. And then she goes and watches uh, air supply. Is it air supply? Is that right? Yeah. Air supply lost in love <laughs> and uh, over and over and over on a loop. And it's completely hilarious. Where did this come from? Where'd you find this little girl? And thank you for the help. <laughs> um, well, it came from um, slightly autobiographical. Um, I, you know, my, my parents worked full time and I would come home from school and the television was my babysitter. Uh, and I would, you know, have lots of fun by myself. Uh, eat lots of cereal, um, but um, yeah, I just really wanted to present this like fun, uh, uplifting version of a Latinx experience. Um, I love all these movies about like immigration and you know um, the border, and like these movies are very important. But I just wanted to create something that was fun because I want uh, my culture, my community, to exist in a universal sort of like, we can make comedies and we can make, you know, action movies. We can make political movies. Um, so I'm just trying to tell a really beautiful, positive, uplifting story that when anyone watches it, they can relate to it, but it just so happens to be about a Latinx family. So I don't know if that answered your question, but. It totally did. It reminds me of what I, I got to interview Issa Rae earlier this year where she talked about how she wanted to show how black people are like totally awkward and insecure in her show. And just like, we don't have, you know, like, we don't want to actually be, you know, it's not, who's just, she doesn't want, to, doesn't want to write about black pain. Uh, she wants to write about like funny, funny stuff that happens in her life as a regular human being. So yes, I totally relate to what you're saying. And it, the film absolutely succeeds in that regard. There is uh, also a, an adult in the, in the story who comes in and, um, has to discover the latchkey kid, but has her own trauma. Um, I'd love to hear more. Uh, I asked a couple of filmmakers about some of the challenges they they might have faced in filming these things. Um, I I always presume if it's a short, you have like no budget, and I presume you have no time. And then on top of that, you have COVID. So Gabrielle, let me just start with you. How, when did you fil film this? How did you how did you pull it together? Yeah, so I shot it at the end of air supply too, which is, you know, an, an additional layer of complexity. So yeah, so I just, I emailed the manager of air supply and I said, hey, you know, I grew up listening to air supply. I, you know, my dad would play them all the time and uh, I've always been obsessed. So um, can I use their music? And like, I never expected, it was just like, I just emailed them, never expected a response. And not even a few days later, um, he was like, hey, yeah, can you come into my office and, and take a meeting with me? And um, I shared the script with them and they loved it and they were on board. And they actually invited us, they were in Pasadena in LA and they invited us to a concert and backstage. And it was really cool. I mean, my dad, if he would have been there, he would have loved it. Um, Cause- Oh my you know, gosh. And it was also important for me to use um, like we also listen, you know, to music like Air Supply, you know, I don't just, I'm Cuban, I love salsa, but I don't just listen to salsa, right? So just, I just want to show 
the universality of all, like you said, being weird, being awkward. Um, you know, I have another project where uh, the girl is handicapped and she's obsessed with heist movies. So just really showing, really pushing what we expect um, in the characters that that I create is my is my goal. I think so. Did you shoot it during COVID or did you? I did not. I shot it before. I, sh I was like six months pregnant when I shot it. Um, oh my God. What? So I was taking a lot of pee breaks. Um, but um, oh my God. Yeah, it, was like, it was my good luck charm. And when we started touring festivals, uh, I just strapped my baby on and, and off we went. So you do. that's what you do. Okay, so um, how did you find this girl? So um, I'm working on a feature film with Mandalay Pictures, and they work with Jessica Kelly, who cast uh, Precious, and she's cast Jackie and a whole other uh, group of films. And so she actually brought this girl to me, and she was just magic. Like, she's just amazing. So that's how I found her. Yes, yeah, she's amazing. She's just, she's so funny. And, um, and how, how long did you have to shoot it? I shot it in two days. And... Um, yeah, I shot it in two days, and uh, Ava, the young girl, was so sweet because after every take that she would have to eat all this junk food, we'd be like, spit it out, Ava, you don't have to swallow it, and she would look at her mom, and she'd be like, I want to swallow it, so she was eating all this junk food, it was so cute. So you, you had her like on a sugar high for two days, I know. sweet actress, I mean, that, that's, always, that's always helpful, I'm sure. Um, I'd love to hear from, you know, anybody jump in about uh, what you had to deal with in getting your films made, either with budget or production challenges. Um, jump on in. Let's why you look like you want to say something. Uh, yeah, uh, shooting, we shot Team Maryland over two days as well. Uh, we shot it uh, in a weekend, um, which was great. The, the real challenge for our production, obviously we were on a tiny little shoestring budget, but the challenge was finding the location because I wanted a place that sort of looked really upscale that could pass for uh, like a conference room or, or a suite that a, an actual political candidate could have. Um, and that also had enough space to have our skeleton crew and that we could get some movement to some of the shots uh, because I knew it was going to be a uh, one location film. So that was our biggest challenge and we were able to find somewhere in Burbank, the, the residence in of all places, which was great. Um, and uh, it had a huge presidential suite that they, we were able to fit the crew in and our three uh, main actors, and so it was great. That's very cool. Who else wants to jump in? Um, I think a unique struggle that we had, we did shoot before COVID, um, but you know, with all the music that we had to kind of produce, uh, again, on shoestring budgets, it was something that was so intimidating to me that I was like, oh, I don't think I can do this. But again, it really took the musician and my friend Iway, who was just like, we can do this. You know, like, I think it takes those people who are, who know that you're capable of even more than you know yourself. And that makes a huge, such a big difference when you're making these indie, you know, passion projects. And so, yeah, with her help and so many talented musicians and, you know, filmmakers were able to pull through and make three mini songs and shoot them all. And, um, you know, we did some reshoots because we realized, or I realized there are some narrative pieces missing, but the music was always wonderful and from there from the beginning. And um, yeah, I think uh, I'm so grateful for, again, people who, who like champion you on when you don't think you're, you know, you're going to be able to pull something off. Yeah. Jasmine, you have like, you have a, it's like a period um, segment. Like there's two parts to your film. One's in real life, one's in current day. And one is your fantasy, black and white. Um, it's tight, but I mean, was that difficult to pull together? Talk about that a little bit. Um, not really. So I actually was really blessed to be a part of the Beats by Dre Black Features um, program this summer. So it was the first time. Oh. <laughs> it was their first time doing this program. And so it was actually fully funded. Um, so that's something I really wanted to explore because I had access to this funding. I really love period films and really wanted to implement that in my You had a million dollar budget for this? For um, not a million, a little, little less zeros, but <laughs> almost. Um, I think the hardest thing was because we were working with a company, they really enforced the COVID guidelines. And so we could only have 10 people on set, like in total. That's actors, crew, sound, nurse. So a lot of 
the people that you also see in the film um, also had roles in the crew. And they're also my friends. Like I attended college, so all of my friends were in it. And so just kind of adhering to those guidelines um, was the biggest challenge because we really had to interchange a lot of things just to make it work and to adhere to Beats by Dre's guidelines. So that probably was the biggest challenge. But I definitely wanted to do the period piece. Um, that was like the, my favorite part. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, all of you, if you have a view on just your own journey as women filmmakers. Uh, I've been covering this industry for a lot longer than I care to admit and have watched for many years as we have study after study and research paper after research paper coming out, talking about, and, and I talked to the film schools about this too, like half of the classes that graduate are women, but then as we start moving into like actual professional life, the numbers and then the films that are coming out, like the numbers dwindle to like, I don't know, 7% of the top 400 films, you know, something like that. But we all feel like an effort has been made and that something is shifting. If it hasn't shifted, the numbers are improving, but you guys are, you know, really that new generation of voices. I'm just curious, how do you see yourselves in terms of how challenging it, it is or, you, or that you perceive it to be to be a, a female filmmaker and on top of that, a female filmmaker of color? Um, do you feel like there's just, it's, it's, a, it's an insurmountable challenge? You just feel like I'm just going to do my thing. Like, how do you take that in? Anybody just jump on in. Um. For me, it was definitely always intimidating to be, become a filmmaker, um, never having seen anybody who looks like me making stories about things I want to make stories about. Um, you know, I went to film school, I went to undergrad film school, and then I went to grad film school. And honestly, it wasn't even until like maybe halfway through graduate school where I, in my heart, actually believed like, oh, I could do this as a career, like I'm capable of this. Like it took that long to believe that it was even possible, even though I was already on this trajectory. Um, but once I've kind of got my own self-belief about it, I think I've, I've been very lucky that so many people um, in positions of power are, have been people who are, are passionate about empowering, you know, unique voices that have never been really heard before. And um, so in, in my in just my experience, I have seen a shift in the sense that um, a lot of people do care and are, are trying to put their money where their mouth is and um, uplift filmmakers like us. and. Um, that's been my experience. I think that, um, I think it really is a challenge um, because, you know, just in general, Hollywood is a hard place to get anything made. And sometimes you just have to believe in yourself. You have to have that support group who also believes in you that tells you to keep going even when you feel like you can't. I know I have so many friends who are in the thank you credits of Team Maryland who were just there as my cheerleaders who said, you can do it, you can, you can make this happen. And I think the other piece of it is when you do get a chance to make something um, that you offer opportunities to other women. So my entire crew, for the most part, all the department heads were women. My DP was a woman, my producer, um, you know, our costumes and makeup, our first AD. And so I really wanted to make sure that uh, we had women, people of color, queer folks in real positions of power on this film. Mm, that's a great thing. That's a great thing to say. I agree with Latoya because I mean, not only positions of power, but giving that first opportunity to women who are just coming up. Like, I mean, I'm just starting out, but there are people, you know, behind me who want to just get their foot in the door. And so putting, you know, just really putting them on set and giving them that experience to learn from the people um, who are, you know, more experts on set. Um, for me, uh, my experience has been that I'm just sort of, you know, in the trenches. And so it's been hard for me to even identify when there is sort of prejudice. I'm starting, you know, over the course of your career, you sort of start to realize that, but it's very insidious. And so you almost don't really see it. It's not blatant. And so you just think I'm just struggling or I'm just pushing, but you, there are doors opening for other people that you don't even know are there. Mm. Jasmine, you were, you were going to go. Go ahead. Um, I think for me, so I was inspired to become a filmmaker from watching Kiki Palmer, like 
in fourth grade. And so I never, I didn't realize that it was quote unquote a challenge until I educated, I read more about what was going on in the industry. So I think operating from like that childlike mentality of, you know, this is something I'm going to do. I've seen somebody do it and it's possible. So I never really thought of it as a challenge. Um, I just knew it was going to get done. So that's kind of how I kind of look at it. Yeah, and I hate even asking the question because, I mean, if you guys got your films made, you've already climbed huge mountains. Shanrika, did you want to say something? Um, just that I agree with what they all said. You know, I think it is for sure a challenge that, like Kevin said, is insidious. You can't really even see it until you're, like, in it and seeing other people get things that you aren't necessarily receiving. But having a circle of support um, as Latoya mentioned, is incredibly important. And like Jasmine said, kind of going in a little bit naive or childlike, like not being able to realize that you're climbing a mountain um, for sure helps you scale that beast. You know? Yeah, definitely. Gabriella, how about you? So I've always been like a super film nerd, um, but I never felt like being a writer or director was accessible to me. Um, like Agnes Varda and Virgil Lova are two like my favorite filmmakers. Um, but you know, I love the Coen brothers and I love Kubrick and I love Scorsese. And so there's a lot of white men, uh, Tarantino, um, you know, filmmakers whose work I really admire. And it's just, it does, it did feel a little bit like, uh, is this a space for me? Um, but I actually, I did spoken word for about 14 years. I had a career in spoken word as a poet. And I told myself, like, if you can make a living as a spoken word poet, then you can literally do anything. So yeah. when I turned 30, I went back to grad school to Cal Arts and I just started making films. I, you know, I wrote two screenplays at Cal Arts. I, produced four shorts, all by female women of color filmmakers. Um, and yeah, I actually, I really love a challenge. I love a challenge and I love to sort of like prove the world wrong in a way, like prove like there's room for us, like li look at this, like, um, and so, yeah, I just like to mix things up. And I think I'm not intimidated. Um, it is difficult because you know, there's people in positions of power that decide if your film's going to get made or not, or how much money you're going to get to make a movie. Um, but I do just have to believe in myself and, and the story that I'm telling and the heart that I'm bringing. Um, and so that's, I'm sure that's why we're all here. So that's right. Like intention and putting your feet in front, one foot in front of the other. Uh, well, I just want to tell all you guys are a huge inspiration to all of us at Rap Women, to our partners at Women in Film, I'm sure to our partners at Stars, and to all the people who are watching, just the fact that you're out there and, and telling your stories, not to intentionally reflect the name of the thing, but yes, telling your stories is hugely uh, inspirational and emblematic of where we're going and where we need to go as an entertainment industry. So thank you all for being here. Congratulations to each of you. I want to encourage everybody who's watching to go watch their films. They're under seven minutes and you can't jam pack that much entertainment into seven minutes, just like hard to do. So um, please stay part of our community. Please stay in touch with us. I uh, just want to remind each of you who just found out your finals that you were chosen from 1,100 entries. So you should feel incredibly proud that your work bubbled up to that level. Um, we're just very proud to have you and congratulations again. As a reminder to our viewers, you can see these films on the Power Women Summit website. That's rapwomen, one word, dot com. Go to the Marketplace tab and you'll find the full films there. And that's our, the, the wrap for us at the end of a long, wonderful, exciting day of Power Women Summit. We will see everyone back here tomorrow. Thank you.